So, Paul, I hear that you are moving. Yeah, it seems like every few years we'd have to pack everything up and shake the dust off our feet. But, yeah, it's happening this weekend. It's actually going to be uh, the day after this podcast goes up. So your your cover is blown with witness protection and the mob is catching up with you and you just got to pull up stakes and move to a new state. Is that, is well, that what's going I, on? Well, I, I can neither confirm nor deny, uh, I think is how that goes, but... Uh, but yes, essentially. So, so is this a job-related move, or is this you're no, just tired it, of your state? It's being actually on fire? well, I'm yeah, I'm tired of the weather being gorgeous and uh, and of California <laughs> not talking about politics, politics. Right. Okay. Um, but also, uh, my brother is moving. And so we're like, oh, this is awesome. We're going to get, we've always wanted to get out of California for years. And uh, we only came back to be with family because no one would move up with us where we were before. And so now my brother's moving and we're like, yes, we're going to do it. So we're moving. And then my parents are also going to plan on moving in about a year. And so we're, we're finally making the jump. Going to get out of Dodge. Wonderful. That is, that is really cool that the family stays together. One of our problems is that you know, there are no jobs for me here in the programming world. You know, if I go mm -hmm. looking for jobs right. in my area, it's either, a, a, yeah, commute all the way for like an hour and a half into Pittsburgh to, you know, for a real job. Or around here, the town I live in, it's like, you know, well, we could use a COBOL programmer. <laughs> <laughs> right. To maintain the dusty 40-year-old computer we have sitting in our basement. Like, there's nobody... Nobody needs somebody with, like, a video game background around here. My skills and my specialties are not useful here. And the only place that I would be useful is very far away. But we want to be with family. Yeah, it's important as it turns out. Right? It would just make me cry. Like, we lived in Boston for a while, and it just made me sad to be away from my family all the time. Yep. Well, so that's what we're doing. So, good luck with the move. You, you may or may not be available for the show. We don't know. I might get a guest host. Um, I might just host the show myself and make honking noises for an hour next week. You're going to have Wilson, the, the volleyball, on as a guest host? Right, yes. I might sh I might just have a show where I show off my kazoo collection. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> we, we really enjoyed, my family and I really enjoyed the episode you did with Heather, so maybe you could resurrect that one. Oh, yeah, I forgot we did that. Yeah, that was really fun. All right, so this week we don't have much to talk about with video games because we have so many mailbags, so let's not screw around anymore. We're going to see how many of these we can do in one show. And I will go first. Valuable diecast. Help, I'm running out of synonyms for deer. After Disney finally took away from EA their exclusivity to develop Star Wars games... Okay, I've got to stop already from reading this. I meant to cover this weeks ago. This was like two yeah, or three yeah. weeks ago. Uh, Disney took their ball back and was like, if you're not going to make any friggin' video... If all you're going to make is slot machines, then you can't be the exclusive person to make Star Wars anymore. And that and the people rejoiced and it was wonderful. Yeah, and now this isn't like the Disney of yesteryear, but at least they're taking it away from EA. And I hear that they're resurrecting Lucas Arts, maybe. Crazy talk. They're they're gonna resurrect one of the greatest video game houses ever. <laughs> I mean, they can't really resurrect it because LucasArts wasn't the name. It was those people. Right, right. Although there are a lot of good people out there. 
you might send in your resume. Only if they want me to work from home. I'm not leaving my family. <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're not going to call you into the office right now. Right. Send in my resume. Yeah, my specialty is I complain about video game stories after the fact. <laughs> I'm basically Captain Hindsight. All right. So let me try and read this again. After EA took their ball back, the media began to gossip about a new Star Wars KOTOR game, Knights of the Old Republic. For this reason, I was wondering, do you think there is a place for a new Knights of the Old Republic? Assuming it would take place in the Old Republic period, would that franchise still carry its weight? Um, Seamus once mentioned, well, it was Josh, but Seamus agreed, that the first KOTOR was pretty much THE RPG for many players. That wasn't the case in my country. For us, it was gothic. So I don't know how strong the sentiment towards this game is. Was it popular? Is it still? Cheers, Derek. Okay, but what country are you from? That's really interesting. Mm, yeah, that's fascinating. You, you've, you've tantalized us with this detail, and, and you've not told us what country you're from. Well, hopefully Derek shows up in the comments. Right. And I'm curious what that, how much that differs across other countries. Yeah, yeah. What was the RPG? Well, of course, it also differs on, on age, right? Like if you're older, the RPG might have been Ultima or something. Right. And you know, for some countries like, oh, you know, this, this beloved RPG might not have been localized to their language. So the only people in that country that played it were people that knew English. And, and yeah, age has a big part of that. And of course, as you go further in time, as you go further forward in time, we have better localization, you know, as opposed to the old days where, like, nobody bothered. Right. Yeah, so, the, the Final I, Fantasies were, like, on fan translations or whatever for a long time. Right. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. All right. So... Do I think there's a new place for or a place for a new KOTOR? Absolutely. In fact, I think that's the safer bet. I think what the last six years have demonstrated is that nobody knows how to make more stories around the classic time period. Like the prequel trilogy the prequel trilogy 20 years ago now was a mess the sequel trilogy was a mess nobody knows how to put anything in and the, the the intermediate movies have been very hit or miss um you know the, the various spin-offs nothing nothing really was embraced yeah not broadly anyway Right. It's all been, yeah, this movie has its fans, but it also has its st strong critics, and this one nobody likes, and this one nobody cares about enough to dislike. And... So I wasn't so, in touch with the video game uh, community at the time, but I played KOTOR. I think it was the first RPG that <gasps> my brothers and I played. You did? How we, old were we you? Had, we were exposed to Final Fantasy VII when it ported onto PC, but I think KOTOR was the first one that we actually owned and, and played. We were, oh, I don't know, like 10 or something? Maybe older, maybe it was 15. I mean, if I was 15, 14, 13, yeah, I don't know, 13, 10, somewhere on there, early teens. So what did you think of it? Uh, it was okay. I don't play games like most people, and so it was mostly my brothers played it, and they're like, oh, this is great, this is really fun. Uh, so I don't think I even actually played the whole thing, because they would like, we would all play on the same save, and we'd, you know, huddle together and, like, watch all the stuff right. and make decisions together and stuff. But, um, and then I would, you know, do my homework or something, and they'd be playing the, the game, and so I missed some parts. But it was good. I mean, it was, you know, Star Wars. And uh, it was fascinating how you could make your own decisions and you could go wherever you want. And it was like, wow, oh, this is really cool. Like, this is a neat game. 
I think the Old Republic time period is uniquely suited for spin-offs because everything in in and around the original trilogy is so tied up to the lore is so tied to the given lore it's like it's all empire and then luke skywalker shows up and then there's no empire and that forms a very and you know the big heroes are accounted for so you want to have this grand adventure with these people we've never heard of and it's like well where were you when you know the main trilogy was going on and any the original movies are just sort of sealed and i think rather than trying to find gaps in the story where you can wedge another story just set something a hundred years later a hundred or in kotor a thousand years twenty thousand years beforehand and just start with a clean slate don't even worry about don't even worry about the original continuity i know everybody that okay some people are like, but what about Darth Revan? And I want to know what happened to... And what about HK-47? I, I want him to appear. And I'm like, no! That's the same fucking problem that killed the original trilogy. Stop! <laughs> stop trying to constantly import other stories. Just every time, say, yeah, we're sometime in the past. It doesn't matter where. We've got twenty. Yeah, you know, a long years. time. Maybe, maybe long, long ago. Right. Maybe long, long, long ago. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't matter. Just like wipe the slate clean every time. There's a different bad guy. There's a different bunch of good guys. There are some Jedi around if you need them. And then tell your story. Well, and I don't mean, worry you about. You have to have them, right? But. I mean, I guess you do. Okay, in terms of sales, yes, you do. As a storyteller, <laughs> the last thing uh, I want is to is to put Jedi's in my story, because if Jedi shows up and everybody's like, "Hey, everybody, the main characters are here," and I'm like, "No, there are other interesting people in this universe." Right. It would be fun to have uh, some different genre, like you were talking about, you know, maybe some sort of smuggler game or something where you're yeah. doing something a little bit off book. Right. If the Jedi show up, there's something mysterious and you just talk to one and he never even gets out his lightsaber and he never says or, he's a Jedi. He's just a dude in a robe. But you'll know as the player. Because he's right, or or the Jedi's are the antagonists. Like you're a smuggler trying to get some stuff by, and they they like send a Jedi after you to try to track you down. So you got to like oh, do all yeah. this mental stuff to like keep your thoughts in line, and all kinds of you could do all kinds of fun stuff. With like you know trying to play against the Jedi, or just give me a pair of double bladed lightsabers and let me hack my way through another another battalion of off brand stormtroopers. We could do that again. <laughs> story? What story? Oh, somebody built a super weapon and we've got to blow it up. Yeah, although to be fair, KOTOR did that too. Right, right. It totally did. Did uh, KOTOR anyway, 2 yeah. also? Did KOTOR 2 also do have a super weapon at the end? No. No, it did not. And that is why you <laughs> fail. Um, unless, unless we want to count, like, the main character as the super weapon or something, I don't know. Like, <laughs> somehow they made a hole in the force and all the force leaked out of the universe. I don't, I don't remember how it worked. It was very confusing. The super weapon was inside you all along. <laughs> yes, I so think was it was it super popular? It, it, back in the day, that's kind of what my question was earlier, and I think in the email as well. I I believe it was. I, it is very fondly remembered. It sort of set the template for what we thought of was Bioware for about a decade. Hmm. So um, culture-defining, at least for Bioware. Yeah. 
And I think it sort of hammered out this really good feeling of, hey, three player, three characters at a time, exploring an area, combat, talky bits. It fits really well with Star Wars. It fits hmm. well. It fits much better with Star Wars than say just a straight up shooter where you are, you know, the shooter guy that shoots all the guys. That does not, I mean, you can do a Star Wars flavored version of that, but without a lot of dialogue and stuff, it's going to miss, it's going to be missing something. You need characters to play off each other, to have relationships, to do banter. Yeah, KOTOR just really was a good fit for adapting Star Wars. Mechanically. And it's a good setting, because it doesn't have all the baggage. Sold. I'm looking forward to it. Dear Diecast, Wave of Kittens question. Oh man, this is like recursive, recursive Diecast questions now. Wave of Kittens question about ARPGs in episode 330 made me think about Ghost Recon. I don't remember what that question was, but... Neither do I. Uh, it's... It's a series of tactical shooters that became co-op, open-world Ubisoft collectathons where the player feels like Arnold Schwarzenegger in Commando. Breakpoint, the most recent title in 2019, tried to be more like Destiny or Borderlands with randomized loot, gear levels, and raids. I'm not going to read the whole because thing here, but he basically says, "Yeah, he basically says they they put this this RPG thing in, and then they decided to take it out, and then they decided that you could play either way." And then it was really weird because you have like RPG players and, and non-RPG players playing at the same time and they had cross purposes. So final paragraph, I brought Breakpoint after the update and I'm having fun with it. Are there any games you wish would get a patch to become a different subgenre? Stay safe, Dennis. P.S. Breakpoint takes place on Tim Island and you, I'm assuming Seamus, should demand royalties from Ubisoft. I don't want royalties for Tim Island. I don't want to have anything to do with Tim Island. It's a giant document. Tim Island is my document of explaining how how bad everybody is at world building. So if it takes place on Tim Island, <laughs> then it's definitely not some it's something I don't want to be associated with. <laughs> So I I feel like um, Minecraft has had several of these patches where like it keeps evolving and it kind of feels like it's trying to become different games. It it never really becomes like a, a different kind of game, but there's always like these moves in different directions. That's true. And I kind of wish that it would just not get patched and not become a different subgenre. But are there any games that I... See, I can answer this question, but I feel like it's sort of a dick thing to wish for. <laughs> like, like, I like this genre. Uh, you know, I like this other genre. So I want to just stride into your genre and steal a game from it and put it in my genre through a pa post-release patch. So I wouldn't want to do that to a game. I mean, if if you ask, I mean, I'm just going to try and move everything in a more RPG direction where I have more choices and more control over my character build. And So like Honey Pop, basically. <laughs> Damn it! No, I mean you. You wanted to patch Honey Pop to become a different subgenre. Oh, right, right. I thought you meant patch other games to become more like Honey Pop because it technically does have RPG-ish type mechanics, where your character levels up and gets better at being a sex pest. Yeah, I'm having trouble thinking of of a game that I want to be a different subgenre because, like, like you said, if you most of my ideas are just like make it a different game or like take these themes and like do something else with them. Yeah, and 
I mean, my genre of choice is often very story-driven, and nobody patches in that direction. Nobody adds <laughs> story. You know, it's Can you usually... Imagine? Yeah. Oh, we've decided to retroactively add long conversations and world-building to this game. Well, actually, I mean, you know what? I'll bet on release, uh, Satisfactory is going to have something like that. Ooh. Because they're adding yeah. story and like progression and stuff, and there's some sort of overall story that they're going to add to the game. Man, I've suddenly become... I haven't played in months, and I've suddenly become nostalgic for Computer Lady. She doesn't even have a name. No. The one that encourages you not to die because it would cost the company money. Right. Yeah, yeah. I and she's it. not even voiced. It's like, it's literally a text-to-speech emulator. Right. But I, I think that's part of her charm. Like, if they hired an actress to read those lines, I mean, the, the, there's no need to. She's perfect. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's ideal. If I wasn't so busy, I'd go back to Satisfactory. The, the game's been patched a lot since the last time I played. You should that wait till game, the next update. I, they're they're going to have an update pretty soon that's going to break all the, the stuff, so you should you should wait a bit. But yeah, that's, that's pretty fun. All right. Dear Diecast, with the imminent release of the Director's Cut next month, I was curious if either of you had played Disco Elysium, and if so, what are your thoughts? After playing it a few weeks after its release, I was enthralled in the game in a way I haven't been for many years, and I personally think it's in the running for being one of the best RPGs ever, or at the very least, the best of the past 10 years. Many thanks, mocap. So, here's an interesting note about this. You know, every year at the end of the year, I do like this year's theme is this. Like one year it was um, The Walking Dead and Mass Effect 3 both came out. I think it was 2012. And I called that the year we pretended to choose things because, you know, there were so many false choices. <laughs> right. And right. there was another or one. Or maybe, you know, zombies, the, right? Right. And there was another year where there were a lot of games about games or games about making games. And so I called it games about making yeah, games yeah. about making games. Right. So I really love coming up with a theme for the year. And I had the year already had games. Right. And for 2020 was going to be the year of cyberpunk. We were getting... Uh, now, Disco Elysium was already out, but I was going to play it in 2020. And then we were getting Cyberpunk, and we were getting um, Watch Dogs Legion. Watch Dogs, yep. And maybe there was another Cyberpunky type thing I'm thinking of. I can't think of it now. But was anyway, it Bloodlines going to come out. Bloodlines kind of Cyberpunky, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know what the new one's going to be like. It, it looked to me like gothic in the previews, but I have not seen all the previews. Add some ground effect lighting. Oh, cyberpunk. So, I really thought this year was going to, or 2020 was going to be the year of cyberpunk. And then cyberpunk got delayed and it's basically a 2021 game. And, and, and I never got around to playing Disco Elysium. And instead, you know, the theme of 2020 is pretty different for most of us. So I have yeah. not played Disco Elysium, even though everybody says, Seamus, it's cyberpunk. It's a talky RPG. This is your thing. You should be playing this. And it just hasn't... I, I can't even explain why I didn't play it. Like, I had a dead zone in there in the middle of the year where I needed a game. But I guess I wasn't in the mood for that or something. I have no, I can't explain not playing this game. I also have not played it. Uh, not because I wasn't intrigued, but just I don't have time for a, a, an in-depth RPG in my life right now. Um, but I did 
in the background while at work listen to a playthrough. I think it was Loading Ready Run's playthrough, uh, Let's Play of Disco Elysium. And so I'm familiar with the themes and, and the kind of choices you can make. They didn't do an exhaustive playthrough, but you know, they, they chose a path and, uh, and read out all the dialogue and stuff. So it's, it certainly seems like a fascinating, uh, a fascinating exercise. And, uh, I wouldn't be opposed to playing it if there wasn't anything better to do, but I have so many things that I need to do. Right. I wouldn't be uh, opposed to giving it the best uh, RPG ever, though. It seems like it's very well grounded. But can you grind for epic loot? I mean, that's what RPGs are all about. <laughs> Hello. I recall when you were playing with Wii Fit. Oh, that was a while ago, wasn't it? Oh, you talked about creating like ten years ago. Yeah, you talked about creating actual games that included exercising as part of the mechanics. I have been playing Ring Fit Adventure, and it seems to be trying to do that. As to even move through the game, you have to at least lightly jog, and attacks are specific exercises. And even opening chests in the world requires squats. Do you have any thoughts on it, Dame Bert? Thank you, Dame Bert. So I guess since this is directed at me, I'll answer it first. Uh, ten years ago, I would have been a lot more excited about this. Um, I turned 50 this year, and after playing half, after having a really bad time with Half-Life Alex, because of how much it made me uncomfortable to play, some of that was due to the headset itself. But some of it is just standing and and moving around just in a crouched position for a long time made my back hurt. And mm. now I'm much less interested in having games help me exercise. It hurts to... I have to be very careful with what exercises I do. That's a safer way to put it. Um, like doing squats to open a chest. No, I, I couldn't play a game. like my, my knees would really, really hurt. I do do exercises. But they're carefully chosen to, you know, get my heart pumping and, and create exertion without straining my joints. Um, yeah, so I, I'm no longer interested in a video game just having me do arbitrary exercises or giving me motivation to do exercises because I need to carefully choose my exercises to avoid hurting myself. So, no longer interested in that, although it's really interesting that it exists. I wish I, wish I could have tried it 10 years ago. We had, for a time, a Wii balance board or something. Um, but we couldn't find, we couldn't readily find any games that looked like they were fun and also used the accessory. And I feel like if you could have some sort of like, I don't know, some sort of like shoe accessory that you put on that could like, it had an encoder in it or something, uh, for VR, that could be, that could be really cool. But, um, aside, I, I don't know how Ring Fit Adventure does it. Does it have... Now I'm trying to ask Dambert questions. Does it have like tracking or does it have, does it do joint stuff or is it just like basically reverse engineering your movements from the movements of your controllers? I, I don't know. It seems like you'd need like controllers on your ankles if you were really going to do some sort right. of full body tracking. Because with, with tracking like hands and feet and head, you can get pretty good sense of, of where the body is right but yeah with just the Wii controllers or the switch controllers or whatever you got there's no there's well yeah there's there's no way to do full body tracking although it kind of gets by uh my wife does just dance mm. 
and it asks you to do all kinds of motions. And I tried it once, and I tried cheating my ass off. You know, it wants you to do this big arm sweep, but it doesn't know how big your body is. <laughs> right? So <laughs> you can you can get away with doing a lot less than it's at. And, you know, it's like the the dancer on the screen is like picking up their feet and stepping and shaking their hips while they move the controller around. But it's possible to stand there completely rooted in place and just wave the controller back and forth. And to the Wii, that's the same thing. Um, so I would have trouble using something like that as an exercise because I would want to optimize the exercise away. Right, and then right. you just have a you're really a gamer boring and you're going to game it. Exactly. How little effort I can, I can complete this with as little effort as possible. I'm going to optimize this until it is no longer an exercise game. It's just the world's most boring like quick time event. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Diecast. Recently, I watched a video on how replaying Dishonored in 2020 was a very different experience from when it first came out due to the pandemic. Have you ever replayed a game and found that your perception of it is vastly different to your initial reaction because of something you had experienced in the intervening time? Cheers, Ben Hilton. So, this was confusing because I forgot that there was a plague in Dishonored. <laughs> like, that detail right. of the game, just totally forgot about it. And so I was like, why are you... Oh, right, the rat plague. So, yeah, that, that, that probably, you, you know, plagues feel a lot more real to us, where they felt... Plagues, um, how long ago was Dishonored? Was that, like, eight years ago or something? Um, felt like an old-timey problem. Haha, <laughs> the things, the problems they had to face in old-timey times. Not us oh, modern those people. peasants. Those right. hilarious peasants. Before we evolved computer technology, which negates all plagues. <laughs> um, have I ever replayed a game and felt a, a lot? A lot. Um, I remember playing Deus Ex years later and understanding a lot more of the politics that it brought up. Like, it was incredibly dated at the time, but, you know, when it talked about FEMA, I was like, whatever FEMA is. And then, like, tying that, in, I became more aware of the various flavors of conspiracy theories. And so then when I replayed the game, I realized just how overtly it was leaning into existing conspiracy theories. Like, right. This wasn't heard... world building. This was like this was like meme references almost. That's an incredibly good way of put that is exactly it. I realized these were all memes and not made up things. Because I'd never heard of I don't even know if I'd heard of the Illuminati before the game. So, replaying it years later, after, you know, you be on the internet for enough years and eventually you'll run into this stuff, and then replaying Deus Ex and getting the references, that, w that made the game feel very different. And also less interesting, in a way, like, I kind of liked that, oh, they made up all these crazy theories. It's right. so inventive. As if anyone would believe these things. <laughs> right. Um, have, Paul, have you come back to a game later and saw it through very different eyes? Uh, I can't think of many games that I've replayed, although uh, Master of Orion 3, Master of Orion 2, Master of Orion 2 is one that I did go back to years and years after I had first played it. And when I first played it, I was in my teens, 
and uh, and it was just this incredibly complicated um, to strategy 4x thing and there's spaceships and robots and lasers and engine technologies and huge star monsters and like so many things to understand and like it was just this this indescribably complex thing i could never wrap my brain around it and then uh coming back 20 years later and having experienced reading a lot more sci-fi and playing a lot more games and understanding the forex genre a lot better uh, coming back to it, I was like, oh, I see. Like, I, I can kind of see the levers behind the, the facade. Uh, right. So it was it was a lot easier to play, but it also didn't quite have that magical charm. Right. It all feels so mysterious at first, and then once you see it, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I get this. And World of Warcraft, too, I think. Uh, or maybe every... Because I, I played uh, Dark Age of Camelot for a while in college. And uh, all of those MMORPGs, there's something about them that's just like, it's so, there's so much there and there's so much you don't understand about it. And that it's kind of so magical. Dense. Yeah, yeah. Like that kind of magical feeling, right? Like the, the infinite possibilities that could be around any corner. And then coming back to it later and being like, okay, I see there's a random loot table and I've read the wiki and I know, I know where this is coming from. And like, right. not anything could be around any corner. Now I know what's coming around every corner. And, and so it's, it's explored territory now, instead of this, this wild wilderness. Right. Uh, I think some of the early adventure games, uh, this is probably true for games you play as a teenager, especially because mm. as a teen. Oh, um, Leisure Suit Larry, the original. I didn't mm. get a lot. Of, I was just uh, I played that one when I was seventeen, and that was. There were a lot of references I didn't get. <laughs> Adult jokes just went right over your head. Right. Well, it was um, especially the quiz at the beginning. It had a quiz to make sure you're really an adult, and it was really well done. It was, it was a brilliant, brilliant thing because really, as a 17 year old, I was baffled. Like, <laughs> reference to the Chicago Seven. Reference the Chicago 7, that happened just before I was born, or just after, maybe the year I was born, the year directly before or after I was born, right in there. So, of course, I have no memory of it, and it's too recent to be in history books, which means I maybe heard the term, but I didn't know what it was about. You know, to the adults in my life, that wasn't, that's not history, that just happened. Right. Um... And so the, that quiz at the beginning of the game was really good. Like, all of the questions stumped me. And there were a lot of references and jokes like that in the game that I just did not get. And then a few years later, you know, you get a few more years on you, and you sort of backfill that missing bits of history, and it all makes sense in the game. You see a lot more of what the designer was saying. So a lot of the stuff that we'd mentioned before were games that got worse or, or at least not as fulfilling uh, as you played them later. But in this case, you probably got more out of it playing it again. Right. It wasn't so much that I got more out of it. It's just, oh, I see. I didn't get it back then. But now, now I get it. It's very interesting. Dear Diecast, I'd like to hear your thoughts about how far sequels can change the direction, style, or feel of a game series. Your dialogue concerning Thief Deadly Shadows brought this issue to mind. Although I personally enjoyed the game, I also understand that players who loved the sprawling levels might have found the smaller Thief 3 stages less disappointing. I think, I think that was a mistake less disappointing, either disappointing or less interesting. 
You accidentally inverted your meaning. What do you think the limit is for sequels? Or should there even be one? And this one was not signed. Thank you, mystery person. Um, so yeah, that's a really interesting question is how much can you change a sequel? Like you have to change sequels. You, you don't want you have to change just, something. Right. Otherwise, why make it? You know, we don't want just want the same game with better and better graphics. So we want, I mean, and this is something that sort of plagued the game industry for years. It's like, we want, we don't want the same thing. We, we want you to like experiment and innovate and give us something new and unexpected. But also I, I want this familiar thing that I love and I want to have it, you know, every other year. And I don't want you to mess with it too much. Right. And I think you've talked about this before on the blog, probably a lot, uh, about how some games are defined in some people's minds by the mechanics. Some games are defined by the story or the, the kind of story or the atmosphere. Some games are defined by the content in the game. And uh, probably some games are defined by the, the musical presentation or, or the graphical, uh, you know, the, the visual style. And so like changing any one of those things changes something about the game, but maybe that's the thing that someone, or almost certainly that's the thing that someone thought was defining to that game. And so it's like, well, why is this even right. a sequel that you've just thrown away everything that made this game important? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Diablo 3, I felt like, ugh, this doesn't have anything that made me love Diablo 2. I mean, it's similar, it's obviously a sequel, but the feel of playing the game, the tone, the rhythm, everything's changed, and it's just awful. Other people evidently really liked it. So, I have a proposal uh, you can make a game and you can make any kind of sequel you want, but if you make a third sequel, the things that changed between one and two, or the things that stayed the same between one and two have to stay the same for three as well. Oh, I, I can't believe I just made that. I, I haven't posted it yet, but I made that uh, point in an upcoming article. And yes, the yes. second game, the second game is where you define is the the first game defines your starting point and the second game defines your trajectory like you draw a line from the first to the second and that's where it's going and the, you 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 establish all your constants right right and and certainly you can steer it a bit but don't just like zigzag all over the place like if fifa what they keep the same is everything except the players like the the players in the game you get to change those every year and so like fine and people know what to expect and they're happy with that and no one comes to fifa and they're like why are they so playing soccer this is so dumb why don't they make a good <laughs> sequel why not high ally come on we need some high ally right right so like they've established what kind of sequels these are and they stick to it and it's great and that's perfect and like don't mess with that that's that's really cool but it seems like in thief they they made this you know this first game that was like this experiment and it succeeded and it was great and then they made thief 2 and like okay well you're still sneaking around and you're still able to be inventive about your traversal and stuff and then Thief 3, they're like, well, maybe you can't be quite so inventive, and maybe the story is more important. It's like, no, 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 you, you, you gave all that away in Thief 2. If you want to do something different, make a different setting and, you know, different thing, make, call it something else. Well, they did call it Deadly Shadows instead of Thief 3, which is a common thing when you kind of make a spin-off, like Halo... Mm. Halo Wars, when they decided to do an RTS out of this shooter franchise, instead of Halo 5 or whatever they, you, they was up next, you, you do an adjacent thing. Okay, fair. 
Yeah. And that seems like that gives you more room by saying, okay, this isn't a sequel, this is a spin-off. Hmm. Yeah. Although Thief 3 was much less like a spin-off than a sequel. It, that's very true. And this I mean, I don't hate Thief 3. I enjoyed it. I just thought the small levels were tragic. If there's a game to remaster, that's a game that needs to be remastered. Take all those broken up levels and stick them together. They were designed to go in the... I think they were designed to fit in the 64 megabytes of the Xbox. I think. Oh, yeah. Like... Is that true, or am I thinking of... You know what? I'm thinking of Invisible War. Although that's the same time period. That might also be true of Thief, of Thief Deadly Shadows. But, like, the original Xbox just it didn't have memory. They were like, why would our game console need memory? Throw some Assassin's Creed traversal mechanics in there. <laughs> but just, just a, a remaster just to stick the levels together would be amazing. Hmm. Uh, what dear so die cast? Question, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I, I kind of wanted to like ponder this a bit more. Like, what do you think the limit is for sequels? I and like I your conclusion that like if if you're extrapolating a line, like why stop? As long as you're moving along that line, right? As long as you're making progress somewhere, then like yeah, keep going. I guess that's it. Yeah. All right, we'll move on. Dear DieCast, in last week's episode, Seamus mentioned that he's been playing Minecraft again, which made me wonder, what mods do you guys like? I, myself, have been playing some Greg Block, although I like switching it up with Enigmatica 6 and the QOL improvements we got since the update Aquatic. Fail, Tim. Thank you, as always, Tim. All right. For those who are, aren't totally into Minecraft modding, I want to make it clear that when we're talking in this, what Tim's talking about here isn't just a mod, it's a mod pack. This is very common. Like, individual mods aren't that interesting. But you get a bunch of them together and they start forming synergies and then you get something really special. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, packages in C++. Right, and some of the mod packs can be incredibly extensive. Like, I'm not kidding, 100 mods. Although the individual mods are things like Tree Capitator, which allows you to cut down a whole tree by cutting one block instead of cutting each one down individually. Right. And there'll be another one that, like, oh, this mod just adds the ability for you to craft a grass block so that you don't have to, you know, if you want to hurry up and make some grass without waiting for grass to spread. You know, if you want to create a green lawn somewhere and you don't have any grass nearby, it's just adding one block to the game. But, you know, you get a hundred of these and some of them start forming synergies and you'll get... A good mod pack, I think, will add progression to the game. More progression to the game. Yeah. And um, Greg Block, I've never tried. In fact, I've never tried either of these. I, I've never even heard of either of these, but I am not very deep into the Minecraft modding scene. And I, I am deep into it, but I am very picky about my mod about the mods I use. So the mods I really like, one of them is Tinker's Construct. So good. Right. And for those who haven't played it, instead of just building a pickaxe, you get ores, you have a smelter, it liquefies, you build casts, and you build parts of your pickaxe. There'll be the binding, the shaft, and the head and you can build those out of any materials it adds bronze and steel and 
you know, various alloys that you can um, make. And they all have different properties. It's not just, oh, use the best material. It's like, oh, bronze is really good for the handle, you know, because it adds a lot of durability, but you don't want to make the head out of that because, you know, you want to be able to dig up diamonds or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a really cool uh, combinatorial puzzle. Right. And it, by its nature, it makes for a very long progression where, you know, oh, I can make myself a basic pickaxe. The, the other advantage is you don't just keep making pickaxes and then they break and you throw them away. This is, you can, it can break, but you keep the broken thing. It doesn't just evaporate when it breaks. It's still there. It just stops working. And you can, you know, have sharpening tools to repair it. So you don't fill up your inventory with 20 pickaxes before you go digging. That's another nice thing. Right, right. right. And I, I was always curious if mods were able to add materials and mechanics to Tinker's Construct, or if it's just kind of like an airtight I believe box. it is modular. I believe it is modular. And I believe anybody can... Although, I think if you want to add it, I think you have to provide the information, like what the properties of this particular alloy are. It won't automatically... If I add Mithril to the game, it won't automatically get added to Tinker's Construct unless I also provide mm. some extra hooks to tell Tinker's Construct sure, sure. what Mithril does. That's still very cool. So yeah, so Tinker's Construct, so when you're looking at a mod pack, you want to know, does it have Tree Capitator, Tinker's Construct, uh, what else? Um, yeah, I've moved away from Tree Capitator. There's another mod. It's Ore Vine, Vein Miner. I forget what it's called, but it lets you mine out an entire vein by holding down tilde while you dig it. Now, it uses up more durability on your tool, and it uses up more points of hunger, but you don't, you know, if you hit a big iron vein or a big coal vein, you don't have to stand there for a minute and a half breaking <laughs> every block. It just, like, breaks the whole thing and drops it all at the point where you were using your pickaxe, and you pick it up. Nice. And, and it yeah. also works for trees, then, I assume. Yeah, exactly. It breaks whatever block, whatever kind of block you're breaking. So if you do it on dirt, you'll make a giant crater and fall into it and hurt yourself. It, there's a limit, I'm assuming, like a radius or something. Yes. Yeah, there is a limit. And uh, it's very, when you're using stone tools, it's very easy to hit that limit. Like, accidentally hit that button while I'm trying to dig a block of dirt. And instead, it'll dig out a big crater of dirt, break the tool, and drop me into this hole where I get injured. <laughs> Oops, I accidentally excavated the ground under me and fell. <laughs> it's kind of, it's like sawing off the branch you're sitting on, except for it's the ground somehow. Right. It's like, how did I, how did I wind up in this situation? How did I wind up in this wily e. coyote situation where I'm hovering <laughs> in the air above the hole I just dug? <laughs> Seems unlikely. <laughs> right. I don't think anybody can dig quite that fast. Um, but I really love that. So the, to answer the question, the mod pack that I dig that I've been digging for the last year and a half is called Builder's Paradise. And um, it's still stuck on Minecraft 1.12 because Tinker's Construct has not updated. I think the original oh, author... Really? I think the original author abandoned it. The original author was playing hard mode? I, th I think the original author probably, like so many modders, got married, had kids, got a career, one of those three things. And just, you know, there's that magical time when you're just old enough 
to work on this stuff, but before your life gets so filled that you don't have time for it. And that's that magic, like, late high school co slash college, or maybe the first year of your career. But after that, you, you meet somebody, you have some kids, you suddenly have mortgage payments, and you just don't have time for it. And that, hmm. you know, Minecraft mods are, are over a decade old now. So that's happened to a lot of mods. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of software too, just in the, in the broader scale. Yeah, uh, there was equivalent exchange, which I was really into for a while, which is it assigns value to every block in the game. Like a dirt is worth one, and a diamond is worth eight thousand one hundred and ninety-two. So you and you can just put any block into this thing and then extract something of equal value out. So if you want a diamond, you can just dump in 1,892 crap blocks of like stone and dirt and cobblestone and whatever. Yeah. I remember we played on a server with equivalent exchange and it was a survival server. But by the time that we had played it for a couple weeks, it was basically a creative server, right. which was kind of a weird thing where it was like, hang on, if I wanted to play creative, I could have just done that. Like, I didn't have to do all this work to play in creative mode. Right. It's, it's, you earn your way into creative mode. I actually really liked that about it. Hmm. Um, but that one got it, you know, somebody made it abandoned it somebody else took up the the mantle maintained it brought it forward into newer versions of minecraft and then they abandoned it and i think i'm not sure what the status of it now i think it's currently abandoned again it's either it's second or third home and it keeps being orphaned so i i said i didn't play much modded minecraft but uh, the few times I've dipped my toe into the great ocean of modding was uh, we came out with, and this is mostly my wife that ended up playing this, but Hexit, H-E-X-X-I-T, -X -X I think. And oh, uh, it's got it's got Tinker's Construct. It's got um, the, uh, what is it, the Chocobo, the whole Chocobo thing, Chocobo mod. It's got like a whole bunch, it's a big old mod pack, a whole bunch of stuff. And it was basically like, kind of like an RPG adventure game. Like it kind of shifted Minecraft into that. There were like dungeons, a bunch of different kinds of dungeons and they all had bosses in them and you could defeat the bosses and each one had a unique kind of special item that you could get that had special abilities like grappling hooks and jetpacks and all kinds of stuff. And uh, so then you'd go exploring, trying to find, you know, the wizard's tower or the, where's the giant turtle's castle in this map, you know? And, and uh, it, it would procedurally generate all this stuff. And some of them were pre-made, I think, but I know some of them were procedurally generated. So it was just like this whole playground and then it added like the Twilight Forest mod, I think was in there. And so you could go to this other parallel dimension, kind of like the nether, only it was like just another overworld, but like it had completely other set of mobs and all kinds of different blocks. And so it was I just really this very like... expansive, oh yeah, it's yeah. fun. I really like Twilight Forest. That's just a. It reminds me of in the Narnia books, the magician's nephew, the woods between the worlds. That's yes. kind of what Twilight for Forest feels like to me. This you have the magic pool that you jump in, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, but you you do. It's just such a weird. It's very. It's always. It's always sunset, so there are no mobs on the surface. So it's peaceful, but once you get below ground, it's really dangerous. I'm sorry, oh, I sort yeah. of interrupted so many... your flow there. You were telling us about No, it's, it's fine. It's just, it's so many, I mean, I don't even have to describe it. You can go look it up. I think it's on, um, they, they used to be independent, and then they went to... Uh, what's the feed the beast? I think, and then feed the beast got bought yeah. up by Twitch. Uh, I think. Yeah, 
the the mod I was just talking about, Builder's Parallel Paradise, is through the Feed the Beast launcher. I hate the new launcher. I prefer the old one, but that one's stuck. Like you can't get any mods that are newer than one twelve. So that's another reason I'm stuck on one twelve. <laughs> It's because I, I just hate the new Feed the Beast launcher. It just insists on installing all the games to my overstuffed C drive. And Minecraft is... Minecraft worlds are friggin' big. I don't want those things <laughs> filling up my, my SSD. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those weird things. You know, back in the day... When I was a boy, back when Minecraft was still young, Notch promised everyone, he's like, we're going to have modding interface, we're going to have an official modding interface, so just hang right. on, everybody, it's going to happen. And, uh, and it never happened. Like, it, it still has nope. never happened. And I feel like a lot of these problems are, are issues with, like, Minecraft has never actually supported modding in any way. Like... It, it's never supported it. It's so weird. Like, it's one of the most modded games, and yet it's never supported modding. Right. And I I always, like, the, the dream I always thought of is this game, but with a really good modding API. And then the dream on top of that would be to use, for the modding language, to be in something that can be properly sandboxed, like Python very accessible language that I believe mm, you can, yeah I believe you can sandbox Python so oh, yeah. that so that it's safe to run Python code without it worrying it's gonna install malware sure you just take out all the network UI and all that stuff right um but you know some language like that and have that don't make your own modding don't make your own friggin scripting language <laughs> what you don't and think don't that command Lua. blocks are a good idea right command blocks were like oh that's kind of like that is just simple enough to fall short of being useful i mean you could do cool things with command blocks but it's like it, it's yeah. not quite yeah. Ah. It, like a real proper modding interface with a proper API so that anybody can make a mod and have some reasonable hope that if the API doesn't change, it will still work in new versions. Because the way it is now, everything breaks. Every time there's an update, it just, every mod breaks. Because there's right. no API. And it's yeah, all just based, yeah. it's basically an entire modding system based on code injection. <laughs> well, and they keep doing these weird things. Well, they'll, they'll change the save file format to be more friendly to modding. But it's like, but you, you don't support modding. Like, why are you doing this? This is so strange. Right. It is just. It is a shame we never got that. Now you, I thought, oh, with Microsoft's deep pockets, that's finally... I, I realize it's a hard problem. I realize... <laughs> well, it's also would, not the thing that Microsoft is going to do, right? Like, allow right. everyone access to our platform so they can make whatever they want on it? No. Why would we do I, that? I actually, I actually thought they would just because... I mean, that's one of the things that made Minecraft so viral... But yeah. yeah, it doesn't really make them more money directly. <laughs> but so instead, they, they made mod? their own version that's impossible to mod. Right. It's like, oh, this is really good. Too bad it's useless. <laughs> oh, it's man. The fastest, sleekest, most pointless version of Minecraft. <laughs> Vanilla <laughs> Minecraft. <laughs> It's 60 uh, frames a second. It's hard we've got to do it. Jai's going to come out and and we're going to make moddable Minecraft. It's going to be called 28-sided craft and all the blocks are going to yep. be icosahedrons. <laughs> yes! 
<laughs> that we will we'll we'll figure out a way to get them to pack with no gaps. Yeah, yeah, it, it won't be a Euclidean space, um, but it will work. Yeah, I, we, as soon as I get that figured out, it's it's gonna get done. <sighs> I really wish we had Minecraft with an API with a modding API. That would be so beautiful. And, I mean, and with a, like an underlying data structure that supported the idea that a lot of people were going to be trying to do a lot of different things, but also want to be able to talk to all the other mods. Like, right. it's, like the whole thing was not designed in such a way to make it possible, which is probably why it never happened. Right. A way to easily add blocks. Just a way to easily for somebody to add a simple text file that says... Here is another block. I don't care what the ID number winds up being. That doesn't matter. Here's its name. Here's its properties, its recipe, how you make it. Um, and here's what the textures right. go on the sides of the block. What kind of things you need to make it. Uh, what kind of special properties your mod introduces. How to extrapolate those special properties from other properties if no one else is using your properties. So like someone adds a block to your, your system and they've got a hardness quality or, or whatever. And then someone else makes a mod with a density quality. And like normally those wouldn't talk to each other. But if the system has a built-in thing of like, tell us how to tell how hard a thing should be, or, or at least give us a default, then when someone adds a, a mod that doesn't know anything about your mod, your mod will be able to figure out things about their block or at least use them because you've told the system how to generate the data that you need. Right. Yes. So that mods can interoperate. And maybe Mithril, oh, it doesn't have the hardness thing. So it's, you know, it's basically for the purposes of digging it up, it's basically stone. But you won't wind up with the problem of, I have no idea how we could possibly dig this block, so you can't. <laughs> right. And and the base game should have some basic, you know, starter qualities that you can that everybody can use, and, and like oh, it would be it was so good. Yeah, it would basically every block would have some metadata that can be expanded, and shared between mm. mods, and you know, with defaults. And like that would just be for blocks. And then there would also be like, hey, when this happens, call my function. And when this happens, call my function. And then, you know, now you're now you're on your way to, to modding. <sighs> but no. And I, I've implement, implemented, I think I've implemented Minecraft style world like three times now, three or four times in different languages with different toolkits. I think I played one of them. Right, the one I did in, in Unity. That's the most yeah. recent one I did. That's, of course, not the optimal one. I mean, the optimal one would be to do it in C++ for the extra speed, but then have a really good modding API that talks to some lower-level language. And that's hard. I'll be the first to admit that's really hard. But, boy, that would be a gift to the world. Hmm. Oh, well. If it were easy, if it were easy, somebody would have done it by now. I mean, Minecraft sold for a billion dollars. <laughs> I'll bet you that a lot of people wish they had a billion dollars. There's, there's a ap ample financial incentive to do it. It's just a hard problem. Well, thank you for the lovely questions, everybody. Um, if you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Um, I might have some guest hosts in the upcoming weeks. I don't know. I've got plans. I, I've got to send out some emails. Paul, good luck on your move. I hope everything goes really well. Thanks. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye forever, Paul. Microsoft actually bought it for $2.5 billion.
really? $2.5 billion? That's crazy bananas. I mean, this is my favorite game to ever exist, and I don't think it's worth that much. I know, right? It was like, it's incredible. It's an incredible number. I don't know how they thought it, that was a good idea, but I, I hope they made their money back.